David, please, Bavakasha. Rabbi Gabbai Josh. Thank you all for joining us for Zooming into Pesach. Uh, we have three interesting lectures planned for this evening of half an hour each. I'll be talking about some unusual Pesach customs from east to west. Dr. Tamar Kadari will be talking about Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs in Pesach. And Rabbi Chaim Rowan Becker will be talking about writs, rights, and responsibility, fundamentals of freedom in Egypt, Sinai, and the Seder. Um, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be uh, teaching part of an article that I published many years ago, which is called Pesach Potpourri on the Origin and Development of Some Lesser Known Pesach Customs. Uh, the complete article is found on the Schechter website and Josh Schumann, our very media savvy media coordinator has put the a link to that article on chat so you can read it yourselves uh, later on. So with your permission, I'm going to share a screen. Okay, can you see it? Can you all see it, anybody? Yes. Say yes. <laughs> Josh, you see it? Haya, can you see the text? Okay, Yofi. Um, so in the beginning of the article, what I stress is that um, anybody who is Jewish and observes Jewish law knows that uh, Pesach is filled with hundreds, if not thousands of laws. Uh, indeed, one sixth of Orachayim, uh, of the section of the Shulchan Aruch devoted to Shabbat and holidays and prayer, one sixth of that is devoted to the laws of Pesach. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the laws of Pesach. I'm going to talk about the minagim, the customs of Pesach. Uh, and one of the beauties of living uh, in Eretz Israel for the past 50 years is that in addition to books I've collected from, uh, customs I've collected from books, there are also customs I've collected from people. And I will mention some of them uh, this evening because we have Kibbutz Galiot, the ingathering of the exiles. The first custom is... Um, on Wednesday morning, God willing, I will be uh, burning the chametz across from my home. Uh, and every year when I burn the chametz, I use my lulav or lulavim leftover from Sukkot to burn the chametz. Uh, this custom uh, is based on a saying found in two places in the Babylonian Talmud. It says there in Aramaic, kevan de ne'evad ba mitzvah chadata, ne'eved ba mitzvah acharita. Since uh, one mitzvah was done with whatever it is, let us do another mitzvah with that same object. Uh, and the specific example there is, is that the loaf of bread used for an eruv would be used for a uh, hamotzi. Um, oops. The permutation of that custom, which we'll talk about now, uh, is using the aravot uh, or the lulav to burn the chametz uh, on Erev Pesach. Uh, and as far as I know, this custom is first mentioned by Rabbi Yehuda Reb Kelonimus, who lived in Ashkenaz in Germany in the 12th century. And it says uh, in this medieval source that he would use the aravot, the willows from the lulav, in order to burn the chametz, basing himself on that passage in the Talmud. And in modern times, Iraqi Jews also use the Aravot from Hoshana Rabbah uh, to burn the chametz. And in Yemen, it was the custom to use the lulav, the hadassim, and the Aravot as fuel for the oven when baking matzah shmura. They, until today, the Yemenites like to bake their own matzah for Pesach. And the Jews of Syria, Morocco, and Baghdad use the lulav both for burning the chametz and for baking matzah. And all I know is that when I burn my chametz every year, outside my house, there are many, many people who are bringing their lulavim and using it as part of the bonfire uh, to burn the chametz. This is a very, very early version of recycling. Uh, in this case, recycling for the sake of a mitzvah. Uh, the next custom I'm not gonna discuss, but I'll refer you after I publish this article. Uh, I published a lengthy responsum about wearing white at the Seder and a Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's found in my book, Responds in a Moment, Volume 4. It's also on the Schechter website. Uh, it's called something like, Why Do Jews Wear White uh, on the High Holidays? I'm not going to repeat this at this time. But the bottom line is that, in my opinion, we wear white on these special occasions because white is a symbol of simcha, of joy. 
Uh, and on the holiday of Pesach, we are very joyful because we have left Egypt and are on our way to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, the next custom I would like to discuss is based on a Talmudic passage uh, found in Tanit Folio uh, 20b. And it says there that Rav Huna, a very famous Amora in Babylon, who lived around the year uh, 240, 250 of the Common Era, whenever he ate bread, he would open his door and say, Kol man whoever needs, let him come and eat. In other words, this was not Rav Huna's custom on Pesach. This was Rav Huna's custom throughout the year. And of course, this was adopted on Pesach. And we say in the Halachma Anya paragraph, Kol dichvin yetev yechu, kol dichrich yetev yifsach. Whoever is hungry, let him come and eat. Whoever is needy, let him come and make Pesach. Uh, by the time we arrive at Rav Matityahu Gaon, who lived in Babylon in the ninth century, he says that it was the custom of our forefathers to leave the doors open during the Seder so the poor Jews could join them. But already in his day, this was no longer the custom since they would give food to the poor before Pesach so that they would not have to bake. Uh, and this is the origin of Kimcha de Pischa, uh, the flower for Pesach, or Ma'ot Chitim. When I was growing up, we called it Ma'os Chitim, uh, the money for buying wheat. Uh, and until today, there's a very strong Jewish custom in all the di different Edot and all the different Jewish ethnic groups uh, to give out both money and food before Pesach so that the needy will be able to make their own uh, starim. Uh, and for many, many years, I gave money to the Rabbanit Kapach, Zecher Tzadik uh, uh, and I now continue to give it to her daughter, Naomi, who every year gives out thousands of packages of food before Pesach. But nonetheless, this is based on the original custom of simply inviting people to your Seder. Uh, on the other hand, in Yemen, they would leave the doors open during the Seder, but for a different reason. They said that the redemption was going to come on Pesach Eve, as it says in a tractate of Rosh Hashanah, uh, in Nisan, we were redeemed from Egypt. In Nisan, we will be redeemed in the future. That is why we have the strong custom of uh, Elijah the prophet coming to the Seder. There are pictures of Elijah and the Messiah in many illuminated Haggadot. And the Yemenite Jews would leave their doors open in order to allow a swift exit to greet the Messiah when he came. Nothing like being practical. However, the main custom I wanted to discuss is a rather unusual custom of the Jews of Libya and Jerba. And that is on the first two days of Pesach and on both days of Rosh Hashanah, a stranger could not set foot in their borders nor benefit from their possessions. I'm reading here in the Hebrew. That's in Libya. To close their houses to any outside visitor. They did not let any stranger enter their homes. And the question, of course, is why? And various scholars have given various explanations for this rather odd custom. Rather than kol dichvin yetevi yechol, all the strangers coming into our houses, we're going to close our houses and not let any strangers in, which is clearly not in keeping with the spirit of Pesach. So in 1938, Nachum Slush, who was a famous um, ethnographer and traveler uh, who traveled throughout North Africa and recorded what he saw, he suggested that this was left over from the al persecutions in the 12th century, when the Jews observed Pesach and Rosh Hashanah in secret and were afraid lest informers enter the house and spy on them. Uh, another researcher named Goldberg said that the custom is based on the fact that the Paschal lamb may only be eaten by those who specified a specific Pesach, a specific Paschal group in the Tractate of Psachim. And Free Jesuarts said that the purpose was to prevent non-Jewish neighbors from inundating their Jewish friends for unlimited free food. Uh, I don't find either of those three explanations particularly convincing, though perhaps the first uh, is the most convincing because the Amahad persecutions were very severe uh, in Northern Africa. Uh, in any case, um, the Jews in Maslata in Libya would translate the verse kol into Arabic 
as whoever is hungry, let him come and taste nothing. So this is a bizarre custom of the Jews of Libya and Jerba, which has survived among their descendants until today. Uh, the next custom is a custom that I once made a video about for Schechter a number of years ago, and I dressed up in my costume that I do this every year. Uh, and I, I invented a term for this custom. I call it the custom of the wandering Jew. Um, and this custom is well known in Israel as being the custom of Spartac and Oriental Jews, uh, which is that at various points in the Seder, um, somebody dresses up as if they had left Egypt uh, and other family members ask them what they are doing. And they explain that they have left Egypt and they're on the way to Jerusalem. And there are many, many different permutations of this custom. Uh, for example, Binyamin Hasheni, Binyamin II, who is Binyamin I is Benjamin of Tudela, for whom a street is named in Rechavia, the famous 12th century Jewish traveler. Uh, ben Binyamin II was a famous Jewish traveler in the middle of the 19th century. And his travelogue, um, I think it was originally written in German, but you can read it in German, uh, English, French, and Hebrew. Um, and in this passage, he describes a custom of what he calls the Jews of Asia. Uh, he uses the term uh, Asia. Uh, he says they dress up a young man in clay gola, uh, the clothing of exile. And before the recitation of the Haggadah, he appears before the participants with a staff in his hand and a satchel on his shoulder. And this is the dialogue. I'll first read it in Hebrew. Uh, it's written in a very biblical Hebrew because it's from the middle of the 19th century. And I translated that here into English. From where do you come, O pilgrim? From the land of Egypt, says the lad. Did you have the freedom from the bond of Egypt? Yes, indeed, replies the lad. And now I'm a free man. Where are you going? I'm going to Jerusalem, he replies. With great joy, the participants begin to tell the story of the Exodus. We have a similar description from just five years later. Another famous Jewish traveler from the middle of the 19th century, Rabbi Yaakov Sapir, a two volume work called Evan Sapir. He traveled primarily in Yemen. And this is what he writes. The Seder is observed as is a custom among all Jews. He says all Jews, not me. One of the members of the family takes a matzah, ties it in a scarf on his shoulder and walks around the house. The others ask him, why are you doing this? And he replies, um, so did our ancestors when they left Egypt in haste. The Jews of Morocco had the following custom. After reading the Haggadah, all the men put a stick with a bundle on their shoulders and they leave the house in haste, running and shouting. So did our ancestors leave Egypt, their kneading bowls wrapped in their cloaks upon their shoulders. And again, our friend Nachum Shlush describes a similar custom in Libya before the Seder. This custom is widespread in almost all Oriental lands, and in every country there is a different Nusach. And I have found testimonies of this custom among the Jews of the Caucasus, Iraq, Kurdistan, Jerba, Syria, and among the Sephardic Jews of Seattle. And this is what I knew originally about the custom. But as I began to dig, I discovered to my surprise that this custom is first mentioned in Germany 650 years before Benjamin II describes it in Asia in 1853. And the earliest source for this custom, or maybe I should say the earliest source for this custom that I found, is that of Rabbi Asher of Lunel, this is one of the earliest compilation of Jewish minagim of customs. It was written in Provence around the year 1710. I'll read it first in Hebrew. Shamati ki ba'alamanya achara chilat ha'karpas okrina shulchan velokhima matzot vekorchim otam b'mapot venosim otam al tefam velokhim lipinot ha'bayit 
ואחר כך חוזרים למקומם ואומר הגדה, which is exactly what I just translated here. He says it's a custom from Alemania, from Germany, that after Karpas, they would do this hatsaga, this skit, walk around the corners of the house and then return to their places and recite the Haggadah. We skip forward to the 16th century and the Maharsha, Rabbi Shlomo Luria, who lived in Lublin, devoted one of his responsa to the laws of the Seder. And this is a very small part of that responsum. He says, that after the meal, as opposed to most of these customs that take place before the Magid section, Rav Shlomo Luria says that after the meal, before they eat the afikoman, they take out the afikoman, which of course was wrapped in a cover, uh, the balabait drapes it behind him and he walks Dalad Amot, four cubits in his house, and he says, Again, the verse from Exodus chapter 12. And this custom or this uh, passage from the Marshal is quoted in the various commentaries to the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, and I want to show you a picture that I did not put on screen. Uh, this is one of the many facsimiles of the Prague Haggadah. The Prague Haggadah is one of the first printed Haggadot, which was printed with beautiful woodcuts in the year 1526 in Prague. Um, and in the middle of the Magid section, uh, when it talks about uh, they would bake the dough, which they brought out of uh, Egypt. Um, and they didn't have time to wait. Uh, in the Prague Haggadah, it's sort of near the binding, so it's hard to see. In the Prague Haggadah, you have a picture of what I call a wandering Jew, uh, which is a man with a staff and with a bundle over his shoulder. Uh, this is Prague 1526. The passage we just read from Rav Shlomo Luria is Lublin, uh, almost the exact same time period. It could be that the illustrator of the Prague Haggadah was aware of this custom. And Interestingly enough, as we conclude this custom, this custom was widespread both in Hungary and among German Jews until today. Uh, in 1951, shortly after the Holocaust, Professor Alexander Scheiber uh, was the head of the rabbinical seminary in Budapest, which managed to survive under the communists. And he was also a very famous ethnographer and anthropologist. And he published a brief article in Hebrew in 1951 where he's documenting the customs of his students at the Budapest Rabbinical Seminary in 1951, just six years after the end of the Holocaust, when of course, unfortunately, half of the Hungarian Jews had been murdered. And he says that among his students who came from, and of course, it's hard to pronounce these towns, from the Hungarian towns of Satmar, Zemplin, Vats, Tisvolgar, and Puntok, they had similar customs, in the latter town, when they reached Yachatz, uh, where they put away the afikoman, the father would wrap the afikoman in a scarf, put it on his shoulder, stand up and say to his family in Yiddish, Gamir, Gamir, let us go, let us go. So we see a Hungarian German version of the custom. And this custom has survived among German speaking Jews until today. Uh, 30 years ago, when I lectured on this topic in Jerusalem before Pesach, an elderly woman came over to me. Unfortunately, I think I have her name written down somewhere. And she told me that in Karlsruhe, in Southern Germany, her father would put the matzah wrapped in the Seder Tuch, which was the white matzah cover on his shoulder. And he would say in German, so sind die Kinder Israel aus Mitzrayim gegangen, so war es. Thus did the children of Israel leave Egypt, so it was. So we see here a custom that is ostensibly a custom of a dot Mizrach uh, of Jews of Oriental lands, it turns out that it existed in Provence, in Poland, in Prague, in Hungary, and in Germany uh, up until the Holocaust and after the Holocaust as well. And this is why for many years since I discovered this custom, uh, I do this custom every year at our Seder. I used to do it with my children. 
they're all grown. Now my wife, Dory, and I do it with our grandchildren. Uh, I dress up, I'm of course wearing a kittel. I take a staff in my hand and I go out with some of the kids, some of the other kids remain inside. And we have this dialogue uh, as described by Binyamina Sheni, uh, where um, we come in and somebody sitting at the table says, Minayim batem, from where did you come? Meyaretz Misraim, Lana Taole, where are you going? Lirushalayim, et cetera, et cetera. This entire dialogue, and I've been doing it for some 35 years, and I highly recommend that you do it with your children and your grandchildren, and you can copy the dialogue from my article and expand upon it as you wish. The main thing is that it is a wonderful way uh, of keeping the children active and alert at the Seder. Uh, the last custom we will discuss this evening due to lack of time is the custom which I call the Seder plate on the head. Um, and I want to dedicate this portion of my shiur to the memory of Shmuel ben Alal, Hashem Yikom Damo. Shmuel ben Alal, Dr. Shmuel ben Alal was an Israeli educator um, whom I knew for many, many years. And he was killed in a terrorist attack in Africa uh, some 10 years ago. Uh, and he originally told me about a number of the customs that I discuss in this article. Uh, he was a Moroccan Jew where the entire village from Morocco got up, I don't know exactly in what year, and they moved to Venezuela. Uh, and in Venezuela, they were able to preserve all of their original Moroccan customs because they were living as a kila, as one community in Venezuela. And this is what he told me in 1985, that in his family, they recite this sentence, Bivhilu yatsanu mi Mitzrayim, in haste we left Egypt, which is a sentence found in all uh, Sephardic or Haggadot of Edora Mizrach at the beginning of the uh, Seder. Uh, and they recite it three times before Halach Ma'anya. And the person leading the Seder walks around the table three times, tapping the Seder plate uh, on the head uh, of every participant at the Seder, each time tapping harder. And the children like to jump up in order to hit the Seder plate with their heads. However, this custom did not begin in Morocco in the 20th century. It began apparently in Spain in the 14th century. And this is an interesting custom because this is a custom where the visual evidence precedes the written evidence by a few hundred years. Uh, if you can see the picture I'm holding up from the Schefter Haggadah, uh, this is the Barcelona Haggadah approximately the year 1350. You can see there's a family well-dressed at the, at the Seder table and the father is putting That is the earliest evidence we have for this custom. A few hundred years before I found written evidence uh, for the custom. Um, and the written evidence, sorry, For example, we have the Guadalajara Haggadah, one of the Hebrew books printed in Spain before the expulsion around the year 1480. It's the first known printed Haggadah. And before Halach Ma'aniya, the instructions say, Vinosin hake'ara arashea tinokot. And you lift or you carry the Seder plate over the heads of the children. The Chida Rabbi Chaim Yosef David Azulai visited Tunis in 1774. He was from Israel and Italy. And he describes this uh, Seder plate custom. Uh, Benjamin II, whom we mentioned before, says that this is the custom of North African Jews, especially in Tunis around the year 1853. And if a person did not have the Seder plate passed over his head, he believed that we, he would be unlucky for the rest of his life. Uh, an interesting episode happened some 100 years ago in Omzav in the Sahara Desert. Rabbi Alexander Levinson, an Ashkenazic Jew, was visiting this, in his opinion, this exotic Jewish community. And he's sitting at the Seder, and the eldest person touched his head with the Seder plate. Well, of course, Levinson, being an Ashkenazic Jew, had no idea in the world why this person was putting the Seder plate on his head. He jumps up and he flipped the entire Seder plate. 
Uh, needless to say, the other people at the Seder were rather upset and they were angry at him. So he immediately made up an explanation. He told them that he had flipped over to the Seder plate in order to remember the parting of the Red Sea. Uh, apparently that convinced them because they calmed down, but he simply had no clue what this custom was. Uh, it's also described by Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Toledano, another Jewish ethnographer who describes Moroccan Jewish customs in his famous book, Ner HaMa'arav in the year 1911. Ida Cowan describes the same custom among the Jews of Izmir, Turkey in 1971. And it is common until today among the Jews of Libya, Morocco, Tunis, and Jerba. Uh, and since my wife, Dori, is half Moroccan, uh, this is our custom as well. And every year at the Seder, uh, one of us walks around the table and taps the Seder plate and moves it around the head of all the participants three times as we're singing. And you do it three times. You sing it three times as you move it around the head of all the participants. What is the reason for the custom? And, and with this, we will uh, conclude. Uh, Rav Shem Tov Gagin uh, wrote a very famous book about Jewish customs called Keter Shem Tov about 90 years ago. And he asked some Moroccan rabbis in 1932, why do Moroccan Jews do this? And they said that they believe that if they circle the Seder plate around the heads of the participants, it can protect them from all harm and a long list of blessings will come upon them. Rabbi Gagin himself wrote that in his opinion, the custom was meant to encourage the children to ask questions, which is why we do all sorts of interesting things at the Seder. Uh, Dr. Tuvia Preshel, in his article about this custom has a different explanation. And this is his explanation. It says in the Talmud, Lama Okrim Shulchan, why do we uproot the table? And it says the house of Rabbi Yanai said, so the children should notice and ask questions. Now, this has to do with the fact that in the Talmudic period, every person had their own individual table, sort of like TV dinner tables we used to have in the 1960s. And they would uproot the table. They would take the little table away. That's what it says in the Talmud. Rabbi Moshe Pizanti, writing in uh, 1569, says that he found a source that says, we must lift the Seder plate for the recitation of Manishtana. Furthermore, when they lift the Seder plate, and I emphasize these words, they pass it over the heads of the participants in order that they should wonder about it and ask questions. In other words, Tuvia Preshel says the original custom was to uproot the table, to remove the table. And you'll see in many Haggadot, it says before Halach Ma'anya, you take the Seder plate and you put it on the side. Okay, that's uprooting the table. But by the time we get to the 16th century, uh, Rabbi Moshe Pizanti says, that in addition to lifting the Seder plate, they would pass it over the heads of the participants in order that they should wonder about it and ask questions. And this apparently, says Tuvia Preshel, led to the fact that the father would place the Seder plate on the children's heads, move it around the children's heads, and slowly but surely the custom developed into the full-blown custom we have today of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews who pass the Seder plate around the heads of the participants every year at the Seder. So I hope I have introduced you to some customs you do not know, and perhaps you will adopt them, the custom of the wandering Jew, the custom of the three rounds of the Seder plate around the head. But I think that the beauty of all these customs is first of all, kibbutz galiyot, the gathering of the exiles in the state of Israel. Uh, and second of all, kadesh tinokoti shalu, in order that the children should ask questions. And these types of unusual customs keep the children awake and alert at the Seder. So Darabah, thank you very much. And now we will segue over to a very different aspect of the Seder. And Dr. Tamar Kadari will talk about the season of singing has come, the songs of songs and Pesach. Let me take this off. Thank you, David. That was very interesting. I learned a lot. Uh, I'll share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Yes, it is there. Thank you. So it is customary 
to read the Song of Songs on Pesach. According to some traditions, we read it on Leila Seder after completing the Haggadah. This is the Spardic and Oriental tradition. And after finishing the whole Haggadah, it's already the middle of the night, maybe even later, uh, we start uh, reciting the Song of Songs. So uh, this is what is done in some houses. According to other traditions, we read the Song of Songs in synagogue on Shabbat Chol HaMoed. There's always the Shabbat on Chol HaMoed, or sometimes Pesach itself is on Shabbat. And according to the Ashkenazic tradition, we read uh, the Song of Songs in synagogue in the morning prayer. Then we read the whole um, um, scroll. So the earliest evidence to the reading of the Song of Songs on Pesach is a text from the 8th century in Masechet Safrim. As a rabbinic scholar, this is considered a late source because it's later than uh, rabbinic sources. And we can see here in Tractate Safrim, in the case of the Song of Songs, it is read on the last two nights of the Passover festival, half of it on the first night and the other half on the second night. So this tradition is somewhat different from our tradition today, and it already reflects a reality in which people celebrate two days of Yom Tov, like some of you do, uh, and uh, that's interesting. But uh, I want to raise the question, why do we read the Song of Songs on Pesach? So the springtime atmosphere of bloom and blossoming described in the Song of Songs provides a natural link to the holiday of spring. And if we read some of the verses, as we can see here, my beloved spoke thus to me, arise my darling, my fair one, come away. For now the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, the blossoms have appeared in the land. The season of singing has come, the song of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree gives forth her green figs. The vines and blossom give off fragrance. Arise, my darling, my fair one, come away. So we can really smell the scents and the fragrances of spring in these verses and hear the whistles, whistle of the birds. And uh, we can really understand the connection of the Song of Songs to this time of the year. But if we look at the rabbinic sources, they teach us that the connection between the Song of Songs and Pesach goes much, much deeper. And the rabbis read the verses of Song of Songs allegorically. Uh, and when they wanted to express their love to God, they looked for the most appropriate verses that can express these very deep feelings and the longing for their closeness to God some verses that will elevate their spiritual and religious feelings. And in the Song of Songs, we have, from one side, we have the beloved that speaks to the maiden and expresses his love. And she too tells the daughters, daughters of the Jerusalem of his beauty and her longing for him using rich imagery and metaphor. So let's take an example from the verses from chapter five. My beloved is clear skinned and ruddy, distinguished among, among 10,000. His head is finest gold, his locks are curled and as black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by water courses, bathing in milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like beds of spices, producing sweet perfumes. His lips are lilies, breathing of finest merit. His hands are, are as rods of gold, studded with topaz pink. His body is polished ivory, invalid with sapphires. His legs are like marble pillars, set on bases of fine gold. His form is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is delicious and all of him is delightful. 
such is my beloved and such is my lover, O maidens of Jerusalem. So we can see really a uh, very uh, descript descriptive uh, um, um, this, uh, descriptions of the, of the beloved. This is very unique in the Bible. And the role of the physical descriptions in these verses is to praise the handsome beloved, but even more so to testify to the lover's intimate connection, which allows them to gaze at one another and linger over every feature. So reading these verses allegorically really expresses very close feelings to God, religious feelings. And this is something very special when you read it allegorically, when the beloved is God and the maiden are the people of Israel. So when, but when was such an intimate connection between the people of Israel and God possible? When could they watch and gaze uh, God and describe him so intimately? When was that possible? When can a re religious person say, I really saw the body of God? So according to Midrash, Song of Songs Rabbah, uh, there are four fundamental understandings of the interpretation of the Song of Songs. And so uh, the rabbis say, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Where was it said? Rabbi Hanina Bob said, this was said at sea, for it's written, I have likened you, my darling, to a mare in Pharaoh's chariots. Rabbi Yochanan said, this was said at Sinai, for it is written, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Rabbi Meir said this was said at the tent of meeting and brings proof from the verse, awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. The rabbi said this was said at the temple, and they bring proof from the same verse, awake, O north wind. So the sages ask, where was it said? That is, in what context was the Song of Songs chanted, or what event does it describe? The dispute presents four different positions, the, the splitting of the sea, the Red Sea, the giving of the Torah at Sinai, the dedication or inauguration of the tabernacle, and the inauguration of Solomon's temple. And we, of course, will uh, concentrate on the first position. So according to Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa, this was said at the sea, for it is written, I have likened you, my darling, to a mare in Pharaoh's chariots. So using this uh, verse from the Song of Songs as describing the people of uh, Israel in a very uh, unique uh, moment. And Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa believed that the entire book of the Song of Songs should be read according to this line of interpretation, the exodus from Egypt and the splitting of the sea. So um, these descriptions of the beloved and the maiden in the Song of Songs are actually the descriptions of the people of Israel and God during the exodus of Egypt and the splitting of the sea. And we will now, uh, I will now uh, bring an example for this. So the, the deep uh, connection of the story is, uh, this is a love song. And if we think of the history of the people, so uh, the Song of Songs expresses the beginning of this relationship, the beginning of the relationship when the people of Israel became a nation and um, came out of Egypt and became um, independent. And then this relationship goes on and develops during uh, their walking in the wilderness and so on. So let's choose an example of a Midrash that uh, uh, for the way the Song of Songs is interpreted as describing the splitting of the sea, according to the method of Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa.
So this is from Midrash Song of Song of Rabba on verses 2.14. Oh, my dove that is in the clefts of the rock, in the covert of the cliff, let me see your countenance, let me hear your voice, for sweet is your voice, and your countenance is calmly. The school of Rabbi Ismael learned, to what were the people of Israel likened when they left Egypt? To a dove that fled from the hawk and hid in the cleft, cleft of the rock, of a rock, only to find there a nesting snake. She could not stay in the rock because of the snake, and she could not retreat outside because of the hawk. What did she do? She, she screamed and flapped her wings so that the dove, dovecot master would come rescue her. So it was with Israel at the sea. They could not enter the sea, for it had, it had not yet been split. They could not retreat, for Pharaoh was approaching. What did they do? They were afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to God. And immediately, God saved Israel that day. So, let me go back. Okay. Exodus 14 tells the story of, the, of Israel's exodus from Egypt. Although Pharaoh was sent has sent Israel out of his land, he quickly regrets it. Seeing that Israel has turned in the direction of the desert, he concludes that they have lost their way. They are entangled in the land the wilderness, the wilderness has shut them in. He harnesses his chariot and gives chase, following the people of Israel with a large army. They catch up to Israel, who is camped in the sh on the shores of the Red Sea. This dramatic moment is described in the parable. The parable describes <clears throat> the dove in flight from the hawk. Sorry. <clears throat> the bird of prey circling above dominates the skies, and the snake in the cleft in the rock lay in wait on the ground. Escape by flight above or hiding below are both impossible. There appear to be no way out. There is an imbalance of power between these two carnivorous creatures, the hawk and the snake, opposed to one vegetarian bird, the dove. To the reader of the Midrash, it appears that her fate is sealed that she will die either in a hawk's talons or in the snake's fangs. But the deliverance comes from an unexpected direction. The dove cries out to her master. Salvation comes in the form of a human who can hurl his furry on the animals. The hawk and snake discover to their surprise that the dove is not wild, but belongs to her master who comes to her aid, dispelling the danger and saving her. Beauty of rabbinic midrashim is that they set biblical stories in a new and refreshing light. This parable on concretizes the danger in which the Israelites found themselves fleeing from the Egyptians. It's interesting that the image of a hawk symbolizes the Egyptian god Horus, one of the nine major gods of, the ancient, of ancient Egypt. Horus was associated with Pharaoh and thought to be protector and pa patron of the king. The Israelites are fleeing from the Egyptians to the desert, only to encounter the threatening sea. The author dwells on this moment of hopelessness, and the Egyptians pursued after them and overtook them in camping by the sea. Danger engulfs them from all sides, from land and from sea, 
and they know they have no escape. They are overwhelmed by fear and terror and cry out to God. The Egyptians are sure that Israel is their easy prey because the desert has closed in upon them. But just then, rescue comes from an unexpected direction. They were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to God. And God saved Israel that day out of the hands of the Egyptians. God easily overcomes the Egyptian army, its horses, chariots, and officers. The Egyptians are surprised not only by, by God's appearance outside of the land of Egypt, by also, but also by his ability to pave a totality, a totally unexpected path of deliverance by splitting the Red Sea. At that moment, the Egyptians realize that Israel is a special nation, that God comes to their aid as soon as they cry out to him. Just as it is, it, it is clear that man has domination over the animals, it becomes evident that God dominates all his creations, the Egyptians and the sea both, and thus only from him can Israel seek full deliverance. <clears throat> The parable, <clears throat> the parable is not only a story about the splitting of the sea, but also transmits a relevant message to its audience in the early rabbinic period. Enemies press from all sides and there is no apparent way out. The author's message is to remember that when threatened, we need only to cry out to God, who will hear, come and save us. The parallel between Israel and the tame dove is not accidental. The author wish, wishes to stress that Israel's strength does not lie in military skill, nor will fleeing to caves and hiding places bring salvation. True deliverance comes from God. God will fight for you, and you will hold your peace. In this light, we can conclude that the parable of the dove interprets the verses from the Song of Songs in the context of the splitting of the sea. According to the method, it was said at the sea. What is the significance of the choice of this method? And what does it say about the verse from the Song of Songs? The splitting of the Red Sea was an event at which Israel experienced direct revelation of God. Their witnessing of God was so sweeping and so imposing that the sages declared, the merest handmaiden at the sea saw that I, what Isaiah and Ezekiel never saw. This is from the Mechilta de Rabbi Ismail. And in Yosefta Sota, a tot on its mother's knees, and a babe suckling at its mother's breast, even a fetus in its mother's womb, witnessed, witnessed the Shekhinah. At this uplifting moment, they broke into song. Yet Israel sang not only the song of the sea, the Shirat Hayam, uh, what we are used to read also uh, on Passover, uh, on Shabbat, uh, during the Pesach, but also another song they sang at the same time was the Song of Songs. The verses of the Song of Song take on a holy dimension and are presented as words of prophecy, an expression of the experience of the witnessing of God face to face. The Song of Songs enhances the splitting of the sea with its ambience of a longed for encounter between a pair of lovers. 
The Song of Songs adds a new quality to the God and Israel relationship. Not only as a dove and her master, with its elements of caring and lordship, but also as lovers who share a closeness and great love. So if we go back to the verses uh, described, let me go back. So if we go back to these verses described in, in Songs 5, suddenly we understand what Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa means. Here, how can someone describe the beloved, so clear-skinned and ruddy, his locks, his eyes, his cheeks, and so on. This is uh, possible for Israel when they were in, um, in the sea during this historical moment, and they gazed at God, they really saw his hand, they really saw his face, so they could describe him so clearly because they all had revelation during that moment. So according to Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa, the whole uh, book of the Song of Songs is really a description of the relationship between the people of Israel and God during those very special moments. And they were possible because all of the people of Israel had a revelation during the splitting of the sea. So the custom of the reading of Song of Songs and Passover thus renews that lofty religious experience of seeing God face to face. And it, it expresses our keen desire that God's love and concern for us will stand forever. And here I want to conclude with this uh, picture. And uh, let's, let us, uh, let, let me wish for all of us that we have this um, love and uh, feel the concern of God for all of us forever. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you. Tadaraba Tamar. And I yeah. forgot to mention that Tamar. Dr. Tamar Kadari is a senior lecturer in Midrash at Schechter, and she wrote her doctorate on Shira Shirim Raba, the Song of Songs Raba. She's also published quite a few articles on the subject, and she's working on a critical edition of the Song of Songs Raba to be published by Schechter. Uh, I would just ask you a general question, Tamar, which you might have alluded to, but it's always troubled me. Do you think the rabbis really thought that this is what the Song of Songs meant? or they were looking for an excuse to include it in the Bible. <laughs> because obviously, according to the Pshat, it's a love song. So why did they work so hard to connect it to the exodus from Egypt and other uh, allegorical interpretations of the Jewish people and God? I'll regal achat on one foot. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, uh, the Song of Songs is a beautiful love song. And only a person who really knows what love is all about can really use these verses in order to uh, express his love for God. Meaning, uh, I don't think uh, they tried to, to say, no, these verses only express our love to God. I think they used the, the love expressed in the verses and elevated them to their feelings to God. So... They did understand the pshat uh, of the verses and even used them, uh, the, the expressions of love, they, they used them, but uh, they wanted to, uh, when they were looking, how, how could they express their um, religious feelings? They thought these verses are most appropriate from all other verses of the Bible. So I think the Song of Songs was already part of the Bible, and then they gave it uh, mm -hmm. another level of interpretation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and we now segue to our last lecture by Rabbi Chaya Rowan Becker, who is the rabbi for the past 15 years at Ramot Zion in Jerusalem, graduate of the Shechter Rabbinical Seminary, and she is in charge of practical rabbinics at the Shechter Rabbinical Seminary. 
חיה בבקשה. תודה. ארלם, רגע. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. And um, I'm thinking as we approach Pesach, our holiday of, uh, of freedom, and we um, are often, at least I don't know how it is in your communities, but in, our, in, in my surroundings, um, the rhetoric is often uh, one of, you know, you know, people might be asked around the Seder table, what is your Mitzrayim? What is your Egypt? What are you being freed from? Um, what do you want to let go? What do you want to be freed from? And that always kind of rubs me the wrong way <laughs> because, because I feel that uh, Pesach is not a holiday of personal freedom. It's the holiday of national freedom. That's the essence of this holiday. It's, this, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the holiday of our story as a group, as a people. And, um, and often we try, to, um, we try to translate that, or try, we, try to, we try to um, implement the Chol Dor Vador Chayav Adam Lirot Asmo Kiru Yatsam Mitzrayim. Every generation must see itself as if it has left Egypt. And we have to sort of find the personal meaning and the, and the, and the relevant meaning um, to the story of Egypt. And sometimes that gets um, interpreted as what is my personal story? When actually I think that, our, that the call, that, that call is to ask us what is our story today as a group? What is our story today as a nation? Um, what is our Egypt today as a nation? And what will the continuation of that story, of that strive for freedom, of that uh, idealization of freedom and of other values, how does that manifest for us as a people in this, in this, uh, in this generation? <clears throat> and so I want to, um, and, and, and by the way, that's, that's an important differentiation, I think, because, because sometimes those two things are, are um, are mutually exclusive. Sometimes my personal freedom or my personal benefit or my personal well-being sometimes might come in contrast with the group benefit, the, the, what, 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 the, what, the, what the nation needs from me, what the um, people needs from me. I might be called to make um, sacrifices or to make compromises to be able to um, to promote the the general good, and so I think that that the the paying attention to the the the, the tension between these two things, and giving space not only to my own personal um, needs and wants and feelings and connections, but also to the national aspect of things, is especially relevant around Pesach. Erich Fromm, the um, German-born American uh, philosopher, psychologist, um, spoke about freedom in, in, in his, uh, in his uh, book, uh, um, Escape from Freedom, spoke about differentiated between freedom from and freedom to. He said, there's one aspect of freedom, which is separating yourself from from oppression. Um, and there's another aspect of freedom, which is dedicating yourself to self um, um, uh, mimush, to self... Uh, um, Self-fulfillment. Fulfillment, <laughs> thank you. To um, what is it that you, what is it that, that, makes, you, that makes your life meaningful? What is it that, that, that makes your life significant? And I think we can find a similar, um, a similar concept in um, in values that are that this holiday uh, puts forward. We this is all our holidays are holidays of values, but this maybe more than others is a holiday of making note of what our values are, and. Because I think, following what what Erich Fromm is saying, to um, to be truly free, to be truly 
um, liberated is to be able to take note, make note of your values and be very aware of what it is that you are living for. Reform uh, warns us and says, if you don't have that, then you latch on to ideas of totalitarianism because you're looking for connection, you're looking for meaning, you're looking for significance, and that's what fills the gap. But um, even without going there, I think it's very clear that Pesach is the holiday that in which we are called to mark our values. Um, we'll take a look at um, a few sources. Just one second, I'll share, <coughs> share my screen. <coughs> So first of all, first of all, um, so just read a little excerpt from from a reform. This discussion will always be centered around the main theme of this book: that man, the more he gets freedom, the more he gains freedom in the sense of emerging from the original oneness with man and nature, and the more he becomes an individual has no choice but to unite himself with the world in the spontaneity of love and productive work, or else to seek a kind of security by such ties with the world as destroy his freedom and the integrity of his individual self. So what are the values that we are marking for ourselves? First of all, in Shmot, um, as God is promising the people of Israel um, freedom, and uh, uh, um, uh, deliverance, God says to Moshe <clears throat> and sends, sends Moshe to tell the people of Israel, right, the famous verses with the four um, verbs of geulah, of redemption, the four verbs following which we drink four cups and uh, maybe also ask four questions. And, you know, the theme of four is in our, in our uh, Seder. Following these verbs, I am God, tell the children of Israel, I am God. I will take you out, I will free you from the labors of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you from an outstretched arm and through extraordinary chastisements. <laughs> um, and, and then in the next verse, And I will take you to be my people. So these four verbs, I will free you. Yes, right. And I will take, I will free you, I will deliver you, I will redeem you, and I will take you. Those are the four verbs of redemption. But then there are those who will say there are five verbs of redemption, right? Veveti. This one is also a, a verb, and God is promising us to bring us to the land, Ela'aretz. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, <clears throat> um, and I will give it to you for, for your possession. I am Hashem. But I think before Veveti, before this fifth verse, uh, fifth verb, which some people say should be a fifth cup and so on, um, before that verb, there is an actual, there's another verb, right? God says, and then Vehaiti. God says, That's the fifth verb. Veveti is the is the sixth verb, which is also wonderful, a part of our, our redemption, of course, to come to the land of Israel. But part of the story of this redemption is to be taken out from the oppression of Egypt. And Vayiti Lachem Lelohim. That's another verb that God is promising us, not only to take us out, but also to be our God. To be. To be our God, which means that we are taking, we are replacing the uh, affliction and the oppression and the slavery with a presence of God and with a um, mission to walk with God. And we're 
So we're, to use the sort of the, the paradigm that form is talking about, we are replacing the, um, we are, we have freedom from affliction and we have freedom to be God's people. And along those lines, along those lines, um, we are called to choose, to choose values, to choose a way, to choose a path, not only to not be slaves, but what are we? Not only what are we not, but what are we? Yes, what are our values? What do we devote our lives, lives to as a people? And what are we, um, what are, what, what are we called to do in this world besides not being slaves? One of the main mitzvot of, or the main mitzvah probably of Pesach, um, no, not the main mitzvah, one of the main mitzvot of Pesach, um, one about which we have many, many, many laws as Rabbi Gulenkin said, opened and said in the beginning, um, is, is the, uh, the notion of chametz. Chametz, we have the obligation to eat matzah on the first day and maybe also the seven, also seven days. It depends which verse you're reading. Um, and we have also an obligation to not have seol in our house, to not have, this is um, translated here as leaven, but really, or maybe that's the, that's the, the, the essence is that it's it's the it's the sourdough it's the sourdough that 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 is used to um, as uh, as um, as yeast as the predecessor of yeast it is used to in order to uh, um, make the make the um, the bread rise right we mix in order to make to make bread we mix flour and water and if we leave it for a long long time it'll rise and become fluffy bread but if we want to expedite the um, the process will take something that is already um, uh, uh, growing and we'll put it into the bread and it'll make the bread rise faster. So we take sourdough, they, they would take sourdough, they would have sourdough and put it in the, in the, put it together with flour and water and it would make bread faster than letting it sit around for a long time. But we now, we know now there's a, I don't know how it is in America, in Israel there's a fad <clears throat> of people making home-baked, uh, home-grown sourdough, home-baked home, home uh, bread using their own sourdough that they, um, that they feed for men, you know, weeks and weeks, months and months. And we know that this sourdough um, becomes better with time and, and more effective with time. And, and the interest of the person who's making the bread is to keep the sourdough for as long as possible. And Shmot Yudbet is, is telling us a very important, um, is giving us a very important commandment. It's not only telling us, don't have any chametz in your house because you have to eat matzah, you have to eat unleavened bread, so get rid of all the leavened bread and, and uh, get rid of all the leaven. It's telling us every year you need to start over with the food. You have to start over you have to grow your, your sourdough over and over and over again. You're not gonna be able to enjoy the fact that it just keeps growing and growing year after year after year. Every year, you're gonna to have to take it out of your house, right? Remove leaven from your houses and, and you have to start over. <coughs> I was teaching a mechina a few weeks ago, um, through the laws of Pesach, and I told them, I, I said this to them, and they said, why is Judaism so difficult? Why, did we have to make, why does God have to make life so difficult for Jews? What does God care if we'll keep, we'll keep the, the sourdough in our house? Okay, we won't eat it. We won't eat it, but we'll keep it, and then it, we can enjoy it after the holiday. Why do we have to get rid of it? Why do we have to take it out of the house? And I said, I, I, I mean, you may have a different answer. There may be many answers to this question, but my answer was, my answer was, I don't think, God is trying to make life difficult for Jews per se. I think God is trying to say to us, look, bread is the basic of, of our existence, right? Bread and water are the basis of our physical existence. We can't exist without the basic food and, and, and water. God is saying to us, look, the world will 
the world will decide on certain values and certain ways that people should be in their lives. But you should realize as Jews that there are things that are more important than convenience or delicious bread or ease of, of making, producing food. There are things that are more important. And this is a way of saying, it's more important that you're free, that you're a people of freedom, that you're a people who value freedom and a people who strive for, for freedom for yourselves and for everyone around you. That's more important than the ease of making your bread. And so you need to physically act that out. You have to, it's not, only, it's not enough just to say that's more important. You have, to, you, have to actually, you have to actually do it. You have to say, I recognize, I realize that there are things that are more important than my, than my convenience in this life. And I intend to dedicate my life to that. And every year, will come this holiday, this holiday that calls me to freedom, that calls me to thinking about what is my life about? What is my life about as a people? What is my life dedicated to? And at that holiday, I'm going to take out the bread from my house and take out the means of making bread and the ease of making bread and the things that make my bread delicious. And I'm going to start over every year. And that's going to make me, that's going to remind me every year that there are things that are more important even than bread, even and and certainly than than the ease of making bread. The laws of chametz are very stringent, as we know. We have the rule that chametz even right. If we have a tiny piece of chametz in our food, even if it's a, it's more than one one thousandth of the general pot of food, we can't eat that food. Right, it, it 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 won't cancel out the little minuscule piece of chametz. The 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 piece of chametz will be significant in any size of a pot, which is different from the regular laws of kashrut, in which, in many cases, um, if one piece that doesn't belong is in my general pot, um, and it's less than one sixtieth of the general pot, then I can consider it null and void. But but the chametz, that doesn't apply to chametz. Chametz, echad be'elef lo batel. You can't cancel it even in a thousand, one in a thousand. Chametz kol shehu. Um, it, it makes, the, makes your ta'arov, it makes your mixture chametz. And one of the reasons that this became halacha, um, the reason that the Rambam brings is, <coughs> is that chametz, <coughs> excuse me, Chametz, he says, Torah, It doesn't, uh, the, the rules, the, the, the more lenient laws doesn't apply to Chametz. Because Chametz is not always forbidden. It's only forbidden on Pesach. And one day, when Pesach is over, the Chametz will, will be per permitted again. Right. After Pesach, you can eat that kind of food, food that's mixed with chametz. So the prohibition of chametz is a temporary prohibition. It's not like a prohibition of, a, of an animal that you're not supposed to eat. That's always, uh, that's always uh, prohibited. It's a temporary prohibition. And because it's a temporary prohibition, the Rambam says, because it's temporary, you can't, I'm, we're making the laws um, more stringent we're making the laws more radical because you can take it for a week. Because again, because for one week, you live in, in radical uh, awareness. Radical awareness requires radical rules. You, you, you'll be more stringent about your food because it'll make you aware that you can put off, you can put, the, you can, you, you can, you know, you, 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 you are not being called to suffer all the time, like the person from the Mechina asked me. Uh, you're not being called to suffer, you're being called to think, to wait, to consider. And for one week, you'll, you'll uh, be aware of this, uh, of this uh, prohibition in a, in a more uh, radical way. And 
so so again so so both the oh the the uh, extracting the uh, the leaven from the house and also the stringency of the laws of chametz are both geared towards this idea of awareness of a holiday of 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 presence of mind around our food because food is so basic and we're called to be to be um, aware of our choices and what are our choices so. Obviously, it's the Chag of Chirut, it's the Chag of, it's the holiday of, of freedom, right? So, so Chazal have a lot to say about Chirut. Um, Chazal actually are the ones who, who the first ones to use the word Chirut. Chirut the word Chirut doesn't uh, appear in, in, um, in, the, in the Tanakh. Uh, Chirut is a Chazalic word and it, to, 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 to mean freedom. And they made the Midrash, very famous Midrash, on the words charut al aluchot, right? The the um, God says here are the here are the ta- t- uh, the luchot abrit, um, uh, the 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 tables of uh, the tablets of uh, of our covenant, and and look, it's the it's the writing of God on the ta- on the tablets, and it's charut. The writing of God is charut al aluchot. It's engraved on the tablets, and then Chazal make this very famous, well known um, midrash. Saying al tikra charut ela cherut. Don't read charut. Read cherut, which is the same letters with different vowels. Cherut meaning freedom. But there are two types of midrashim who which cite this uh, this idea. One type is the freedom from. Right, the free or freedom of, freedom of from, um, which Erich from talks about. Freedom from. <laughs> Freedom from, thank you. The so one group is the group um, is, is found, uh, we, can find, we find it in Shmot Rabba, we also find it in Shira Shirim Rabba, in Vaikra Rabba, and in Eruvin, in the Talmud. Here is Shmot Rabba for us. They all basically say the same thing in, diff- in slightly different wording. Karut al aluchot, so graven upon the tablets, that's, that's our quote. Ma'u Karut, Rabbi Yehuda, what is Karut? Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yirmiyah and Rabbanan, these all have something to say about it. Rabbi Yehuda says, "Al tikre charut el acherut min galuyot." So Rabbi Yehuda says, "Charut from um, eh, 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 freedom from uh, the exiles." Okay. Rabbi Nachman says, "Charut mi malach hamavet, freedom from the angel of death." And Rabbi Tainu Omrim, our rabbi, is the general group says, "Charut min ayisurin." The rabbis say freedom from afflictions. So whether it's exile or death or affliction, these are all talking about freedom from something, right? We want to, we want to escape from something that makes us suffer, if it's exile or afflictions in general or death or the angel of death. Obviously, we can't escape. I don't really know what they mean by escaping the angel of death because obviously no one's going to escape death. Um, but maybe it's the torment of the angel of death. So that's one group of midrashim. But another group of midrashim says, and this is from this is we find this in Pirkei Avot, and we find this in Avot de Rabbi Natan. In Pirkei Avot, uh, we have. I'm going to read just here the the last two lines. Al tikra charut el acherut. Okay, so whoever uh, graven upon the tablets, read not charut but cherut. There is no free man, but one that occupies himself with the study of Torah. So now we learn that there's not only freedom from affliction, death, and exile, there's also freedom to, freedom to study Torah. The study of Torah for, for the anonymous rabbi who says this is the ultimate expression of freedom. You study Torah, you're a free person. And in Avot Rabbi Natan, it's even um, slightly more explicit. Same verse, same quote. Al tikra charut el acherut. You don't read charut, read cherut. Shekol mi sheosek ba Torah, hareu ben chorin leatzmo. This is, it's almost, the, the wording is almost uh, on a platter for the Erich from uh, uh, claim. Whoever studies Torah, makes himself a free man. 
that is your uh, self-expression, your self-fulfillment, your self, uh, uh, th- that is your, your mission. You, you make yourself a Ben Chorin. You ha- each one of us has the, the power to, to free ourselves by filling our life with something that is uh, of purpose. And here specifically studying Torah, but I think it's not only studying Torah. I think it's this, this, this goes back and, and reflects on what, on what the verses from the Torah are telling us that God took us out of Egypt to be something, not just to not be slaves, to be something. So of course the rabbis, the rabbi's agenda is what will you be? You'll be a Torah scholar, right? That's that's what they that's that's the whole that's the whole uh, um, that's all of Sifrut Chazal in a nutshell, maybe. But um, but 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 be be learn study dedicate your life to something positive, um, and specifically the study of Torah. But not only not only the study of Torah, but also um, and in general, I think that this can also be um, uh, this can be um, magnified and, and expanded, expanded to um, literacy in general, because literacy <clears throat> is the key to knowledge, and literacy is the key to dem- dem- democratic knowledge, uh, knowledge that ev- that is open to everyone, and. Um, and access to knowledge and access to Torah are the the access to knowledge is the basis and the and the and, and the key to freedom. <clears throat> it's very interesting to um, to note that um, this this word charut engraved um, we find the cheret the 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 tool of engraving, it's spelled with a tit and not with a taf, but it's the same. A uh, stylus. <clears throat> Sorry? A stylus. A cheret is a stylus. <laughs> you find the cheret in the story of the, um, I'm gonna stop the sharing here for a second. Um, we find the cheret in the story of, um, of making the golden calf. What does Aaron make the calf with? He makes the calf with the cheret. Vayetzer oto b'cheret. He takes a cheret, which is the, the tool for engraving, for writing, for, for making knowledge accessible. And he misuses it to create the calf and says to the people of Israel, Ele Elohecha Israel, here is your, here is your God. Um, this calf is your God. And we 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 find the cheret also, or the or the the uh, essence of the word charat. Also, in the word Khartoumim, the word Khartoumim, the, the uh, Egyptian magicians who are the counselors to Pharaoh and clearly powerful uh, people in the Egyptian uh, hierarchy, the Khartoumim, uh, the word Khartoumim comes from, um, at least this is according to the Zukhvet uh, Mikrait, um, uh, comes from the word Khertep. Which is an abbreviation of the word which means the priest that reads. So the chartumim, the charat, the cherut, charut are all connected to the concept of literacy, of reading, of knowledge, of learning, of studying. And what is our main mitzvah of Lela Seder, what we, what Rabbi Golinkin calls us to get dressed up and, uh, and, and act out for the sake of our children to learn, right? Because, because teaching your children is the essence of the Seder night. And, and obviously you cannot teach that which you don't know. And so teaching that the next generation is also a call to study and to learn and to read and to be um, to be knowledgeable and informed, and um, and 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 so we see that everything kind of tie all all of these uh, concepts tie together to one aspect, not obviously not the only aspect, but one aspect of the call for freedom in leaving Egypt 
is not just to uh, relieve ourselves from slavery, but it's also to dedicate ourselves as a people to a mission. The mission includes knowledge, includes literacy, includes making knowledge accessible to everyone so that people can, so that everyone can then be powerful and empowered and be a part of the story and be able to tell, to, to pass on the story to the next generation as we're commanded to do in our homes on Seder night. And so I'll just finish with the suggestion that we uh, consider this holiday, this, this Lela Seder that comes upon us, that we consider um, both what is our, um, what are we being freed from as a people? What are we being freed from? What do we wish to be freed from? What do we wish to be free for or in order to do, in order to achieve and accomplish in this world? And also, what are we um, willing to, what are we willing to sacrifice, compromise? Um, where are we willing to move out of our own personal comfort in order to make that happen? Um, I'll just say one word game in Hebrew, which is certainly not uh, rooted in any uh, linguistic um, logic, but it makes sense when you write out the words, when you write out the word bechirot, choices, also elections, by the way, <laughs> but also choices, um, bechirot, then you have the word bechirot, in freedom, being in freedom. Hag Sameach. Hag Sameach. Thank you, Rabbi Chaya. I particularly enjoyed your connection between cheret, chartumim, and cherut that I've never heard before. Um, I would like to thank <clears throat> Josh Schumann, who organized this entire event, as he does each time, the Zooming into for every holiday. <clears throat> I would like to thank my co-teachers, Dr. Kamara Kadari and Rabbi Chaya Rowan Becker. I'd like to thank Rabbi Mel Cerner and Moise for their kind comments in the chat. <clears throat> Indeed, when we study Torah, we can sometimes forget our tsaris. Uh, and in Israel, during the past three months, we've had a lot of tsaris. Um, and um, I would like to remind you, it's probably too late for this year, but we've advertised that Schechter and Tali have published three Haggadot. The first is the Schechter Haggadah, where I chose the 115 illustrations and Dr. Josh Kolb wrote the commentary in the back. If you like Jewish art, I recommend it. The Lavelle Haggadah by Rabbi Matt Berkowitz, a beautiful family participation Haggadah with his art. Uh, and for those of you who speak Hebrew, the Tali Haggadah, which is a wonderful family participation Haggadah for children and grandchildren, which I use every year uh, with our grandchildren. Uh, in terms of further materials for Pesach, uh, tomorrow we'll be sending out these videos so you can listen to them again or pass them on to other people. Uh, we'll also be sending out my video for Pesach in which I find a connection between the exodus from Egypt and our current strife uh, in the state of Israel. Um, and on Tuesday, we'll be sending out my responsa for Pesach, where I deal with four frequently asked halachic questions uh, about Pesach. Uh, and on Erev Pesach, you can read my article in the Jerusalem Post about the four sons. So this will give you plenty of Torah to study or to listen to or to watch during the next few days. We thank all of you for participating. Uh, our next Zoom event will be the international, the fourth international reading of Megillat HaShoah, which will be An Yom HaShoah, which is April 18th, uh, which is co-sponsored by a lot of other organizations. Um, and it will be 6 p.m. Israel, uh, 11 a.m. New York, and so on and so forth. And we hope that you will tune in for the international reading of Megillat HaShoah, An Yom HaShoah. In the meantime, Todaraba, thank you very much. And Chag Sameach from Jerusalem. Thank you. Chag Sameach. Darabah. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach.